I'll do that right now. Okay, I just started. Thank you, Earl, for the reminder. I appreciate it. You can always put that in the chat. Oh, somebody did, I see. Oh, Julie put love it. Anyway, so anyway, we're going to talk tonight about uh, the issue of uh, religious pluralism and also the issue whether, you know, the, the claim that Jesus is the only way to God is very exclusivistic and narrow. Um, of course, that's it's not a popular claim in today's culture. Uh, it's it's you know it's not easy to believe there's one way to have a relationship with God, and so you know that's what we're going to look at tonight. And so this is a certainly one of the big topics, one of the big questions people have today it comes up with me quite frequently on a college campus. You know, students always ask, "Well, what about people that were raised in another faith? What about?" The fact that that's all they ever knew, you know, they're raised in a different geographical region, they never hear about the gospel, you know, how can God hold them accountable, and what about people that just have no exposure to the gospel, I mean, what about someone that's raised devoutly Jewish, or devoutly Muslim, or devoutly Buddhist, or, or Hindu, or whatever it is, you know, it seems like that's pretty, you know, pretty arrogant to claim there's only one way to have a relationship with God, and it's very narrow, and so those are some of the things we want to talk about tonight, and I'll give some recommended reading here as we go forward. So I think that if you if you do believe Jesus is who he is and you believe the New Testament's reliable, we've done enough meetings on the reliability of the New Testament, so I can't go over that issue tonight. I don't have time. There's other clips there you can watch if you want to do that. But anyway, so we, we know that the command of Jesus is to take the gospel to people, make disciples. Obviously, we people need to hear about the good news before they become a disciple. They generally don't wake up in the morning and say, yeah, I just decided I want to be a disciple of Jesus. Most of the time that doesn't happen. So they hear about it from somebody, hear about us explain it to them, hear about it through a sermon, hear about it through some, maybe something on the radio or they could read a book, sure. That, but a lot of times it's just through proclamation, right? Verbal proclamation. And so we know that we share the good news because as I say in the second bullet point, we want there to be more salt and light in the world. Because the more people that believe in the gospel and trust in Jesus, the Messiah, as their Lord and Savior, will bring more salt and light into a dark world, right? And of course, we should be compelled by the love of God. We know that if the Holy Spirit is indwelling us, if we come to faith in him, that he is the one that wants the Messiah proclaimed. He's, he's there to help have Jesus or Yeshua proclaimed, right? He's not there just to bring honor and glory to himself. There's actually no passage that says the Holy Spirit is there to bring honor and glory to himself. He's there to see the risen Jesus proclaim. And of course, we obviously know that with people without having a relationship with God through Jesus, the New Testament teaches that they're under judgment. That's just what the New Testament teaches. So if your problem's not with me tonight, your problem's with the claims of the New Testament. If you don't accept the New Testament, that's something we can talk about another time, but that's the general claim of the New Testament, people are under judgment right? That's why we share the gospel, because they're walking around uh, broken away from God, not reconciled to God. That's why all of us came to faith. We came out of the judgment of God into a relationship with God, right? So there's just some of the reasons we share the good news. And of course, the one-way thing is something that seems very arrogant uh, in today's culture. And so remember the first believers, the first people who followed uh, Jesus um, were called actually in, in the first century, you know, the way they were in the book of Acts, if you read it, you know, they're called the set, they're kind of like a sect of Judaism, as I've mentioned before. You know, they're called the sect of the Nazarenes, and Paul's the ringleader. But as I say, number two here, they're also called the way. You know, it, that's what they're called. The an early Jesus movement is called like the way. They're so if you talk about Jesus being the way to God, you know, I mean they're they're called the way. Um, just something to remember. Okay, we don't really say that today. I don't think you guys go around saying I'm part of the way. I doubt you many of you say that, but in the first century, that's how they were kind of perceived. You know, they belong to the way, it says on the book of Acts. Okay. And so there is a, a group called the Way International today. They're, they're, they have some, um, no, we don't agree with them about some, some doctrinal issues, the way they view Jesus. That's a topic for another time, but there is a group out there called the Way International. You don't go join the Way International. I'm not saying you should because there's problems with uh, some of their beliefs. But anyway, okay, so now you've probably seen this bumper sticker. Um, if you haven't, I don't know what part of the country you're in, but it's pretty popular. I've seen it all over my city. 
you know, people are supposed to coexist with each other. This is the sign of tolerance, right? And so I, it's been around a while. I mean, I, I think most of you on this call probably have seen it. If you haven't, I'll go ahead and explain it. But um, the C, of course, you know, represents the crescent moon representing Islam. The O is the one symbol for peace. And then you've got the E symbol. Oops, sorry. Go back here. The E symbol, of course, is for both male and female. And then you've got the X represent or the uh, star of David there. You've got the Wiccan symbol. You've got the Chinese yin yang symbol. And then you've got, of course, the Christian symbol there. So um, a lot of people see this, you know, think it's the call to be tolerant, of course. You know, we're supposed to live in harmony and peace, which no believer I know that follows Jesus doesn't believe in living in peaceful relations with others. I don't think anybody wants to be a jerk for Jesus and run around and do stupid things that harm other people. I, I doubt, at least I never met anyone that does um, in my 25 years of being a believer, but maybe they're out there. Hope not. So this is supposed to pr uh, promote religious tolerance. And so, of course, it is true that, you know, we have to be tolerant of people of other faiths. I mean, Jesus calls us to love our neighbors ourselves, you know, and we, we don't want to hate anybody or, you know, or kill them over a different faith. Obviously, that's that should be the hallmark. We should know that. Um, but for the same token, um, there are differences in our beliefs with other faiths or religions, you know, and, you know, these tensions can cause, these can cause tensions sometimes. And, you know, there is, there is truth that we need to be tolerant of one another, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean we have to accept what someone else believes. Just because I disagree with a Muslim or a Mormon or uh, someone else, it doesn't mean that I'm intolerant. It just means that I've looked into the evidence and I know that they all can't be true. And so we just need to understand that tolerance doesn't mean that you can't have disagreement, right? Um, disagreement is part of life. And disagreement comes with religious discussions. We you just can't possibly agree on every single thing. They're all making different truth claims, as we'll see here. And our claim, you know, when we claim that Jesus is the only possible savior for the human race, as I said, sometimes it comes across as exclusive and arrogant. And many people say, well, people just believe what you're raised to believe. That's all you know. You believe, you believe the religion of your own culture. So how dare you say that yours is the right one? Um, yesterday, a student said to me, there is no truth. And I responded back, is that true? You know, because they... I wasn't trying to be snarky, but they said, there is no truth. You can't know if any of them are true. And I said, well, is that true that you can't know if they're true? And, and I was, she just kind of looked at me and I said, that's what you just said. You said, there's no truth that, that you can't know if they all can be true, but you do know that one thing you do know, it's true that they all can't be true. So you do know something that's true. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting discussion, but uh, I can't elaborate anymore. But our claim, of course, is that, you know, Jesus isn't, isn't just a prophet or a man. He's God incarnate. We think that's what the New Testament teaches. We think the Messiah is the only possible savior for the human race. We think that's what the New Testament teaches. We know this. How do we know this? We know this by historical evidence. We can go over the reliability of the New Testament, which you've done here many times. We can talk about the claims of Jesus. We can talk about the resurrection. We can do all that. And of course, we believe it through the work of the Holy Spirit that he comes into our life, the Ruach comes into our life, and he bears witness that Jesus is who he is. We read the New Testament, we're reading it, the Spirit is working our lives and illuminating our minds and showing us this is true. So we know that through religious experience and historical evidence together, right? It's not one or the other. Now, um, one thing I want to mention about salvation, about Jesus being the only way of salvation, we talk about salvation, just remember, um, it's a little broader than the afterlife. We're talking about we look, if you look up, you know, what it means to be saved in the Bible, you know, the way it's translated, it means to be delivered, you know, um, to, to be made whole, to be preserved, taken out of danger into safety, right? Just like in one sense, you could say when the Jewish people were brought out of Egypt, when God brought them out from being under Pharaoh's rule, he saved them. He brought them out from a very terrible situation into a more, uh, a redemption, right? That's one form of salvation there. But um and obviously, now obviously it's broader with us, and we believe that Jesus rescues you or delivers you from being under the judgment of God to, into a correct relationship with God. And but we also believe that when Paul talks about working out your salvation with fear and trembling, that salvation is an ongoing process in this life. We're working out our salvation. Okay, it's something we do every day. We live for the Lord, and salvation. We're living our faith out and and walking with the Lord, cooperating with God, hopefully. Um, you know, you get in these issues, the discussion about justification, how we're justified before God, then we have to kind of live out our sanctification. But 
Um, the point is that, it, you know, we're, we're rescued. I mean, when, we're, we're, when we experience salvation, we're rescued from a life apart from God to a life with God, right? Rescued from a, a, a rebellion um, into a life with God. Now, sometimes we will quote this verse to people, you know, we, when someone brings up, well, I don't think Jesus is the only way, and that's so arrogant, we might say, well, Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Case settled. You're silly for not believing that, and case closed. There it is. Well, it, that can be okay, but if someone doesn't really accept the Bible as an authority, you may be wasting your time, right? I mean, they, you can quote scripture to them all day, and if they don't accept Jesus as who he is, and they only think the New Testament's reliable and authority, or they don't think it's reliable and authority, then you're going to have issues with you know, trying to, uh, you know, use that passage, right? Um, it is powerful. It's a powerful passage, but it just depends on who you're talking to, right? You just have to remember that. And so that's why, you know, when I, you know, when I always uh, talk to people where they're at, if you, if you kind of can take some of these points from my friend, uh, Frank Turks, but I don't know if they could be an atheist, you know, if you just start where they're at, you know, you can go down these 12 points and you can see where they're at. I mean, if they don't believe in God, it's very hard to quote the Bible to them. If they don't believe miracles are possible, it's going to be hard to argue for the resurrection. Um, if, or number six, you know, if they don't believe New Testament's reliable, or they don't believe truth is knowable. I mean, you just have to start where the person's at, you know, wherever they're at. And if you're going to open the New Testament and just start quoting Jesus, you can do that. I mean, that's not saying I'm against that. But sometimes you have to start in other places. You may have to carve out a reason for why you think God, God the Bible exists or something, or why do you think miracles are possible okay you can get that book and read deeper on it if you want um i have presentations on my youtube clip of frank speaking on this at a high state you just type in my youtube channel eric chabot there's only like two eric chabot c-h-a-b-o-t on youtube i think you'll find it there from a high state he's been there several times okay all right now let's go to um okay so the coexist thing is challenging because as I said, when you look at the other face, um, you know, they're making contradictory truth claims. I mean, if you know anything about basics of Christianity or Messianic Judaism, those are Jewish people who believe in Jesus, just like Gentile Christians, we believe that uh, salvation occurs through faith alone in Jesus alone. We don't think there's anything that can be added to that. You can't add your good uh, deeds. You can't uh, work your way with some faith um you know it's faith alone it's trusting in what the messiah has done for you it's his finished work right um i run into people all the time honestly that don't know that sometimes they're even professing believers they still think they're they're working their way hard to get back into right being right with god and i told them that just kind of does away with what jesus really did for you you know i don't know why you would do that because that that that's sad because i can't i can't do it i'm not good enough so if you're good enough to earn your right to have a relationship with god go for it i'm not good enough um, Islam, of course, uh, believes that, you know, by their belief in all of, of course, the, the good works, they do the five pillars of Islam, they might have a place in the afterlife, they don't know for sure, because it's all based on Allah's mercy, none of them really have any kind of assurance what happens to them. Uh, Hinduism is about overcoming karma with reincarnations with good works, they believe you have to keep repeating another life, hopefully you'll get, get the get get a life that's right for once, you'll get rid of the bad things and keep working on it. I ran a girl yesterday, believed that she had a Hindu background. Uh, Buddhism, you know, believes in some kind of salvation. It's mostly working through the Eightfold Path, alleviating suffering in this world, um, avoiding certain desires. And then, of course, humanism, which is basically atheism, they don't believe in any, there's nothing to be saved from anyway. I mean, because you're not, they don't believe in any kind of afterlife. They don't believe in God. So there's nothing to be delivered from. They just believe you just need to keep improving the world through technology and education because humans are at the center of everything, right? So that's, it's irrelevant trying to attain salvation of some kind with a God or a deity. So obviously these things all contradict. And so, you, you know, you can't look at a, the coexist bumper sticker and, and say, yeah, we can we certainly can coexist with each other and love each other, but we can't agree they're all saying the same thing. It's just, it's just no way logically to do that. I once had a girl on campus, I showed this to her on a piece of paper and she said, well, I don't believe that. And I said, what is it you don't believe? I said, these are the claims of each thing. And she said, why? I just don't believe that. I said, well, okay. Well, I mean, if I don't know what to tell you. I mean, just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not true. I mean, these are the claims of each faith. But she didn't like it because it, she wanted them all to be the same. You know, she just didn't like it. So anyway, okay. So, you know, when it comes to different faiths, 
you talk about who is God in, in Christianity, Messianic Judaism, of course, we do believe in one God, but believe God is Trinitary. You know, he, we don't, as, as you look at number two here, traditional Judaism and Islam are Unitarian. They do believe in one God like we do, but they don't believe in Trinitarianism. They don't accept the Trinity, right? They don't think God is one in three persons. So right away, we have a different view of the nature of God with traditional Judaism and Islam, okay? Um, in Hinduism, of course, that's polytheism. That's many gods. They worship over 330 million gods. So that's way definitely incompatible <laughs> with what we believe. Um, so yes, we believe God is one. Of course, God is one in both Testaments, but we believe God has revealed himself in the Father and the Son and the Ruach. And we think we can show biblical evidence to support that. I've done a teaching on the Trinity before. Go to my YouTube channel. It's on here. We did it here. And then Buddhism, you don't really have to believe in a personal God in Buddhism. Uh, some Buddhists I run into don't even believe in God. Um, so it might just be, um, like I said, alleviating suffering in the world. They don't really, Buddha, Buddha's looked up to, respected, and a great teacher. I mean, Buddha's like a teacher or anything, but Jesus is looked up to as a great teacher. But some Buddhists obviously don't believe in a personal God. So depending on who you talk to, okay, it's not mandatory. Um, so you talk about worship. You know, they worship, do we worship the same God? Worship is a response, you know, as I define her on our part to God's initiative to make himself known to us. We, we worship God because we acknowledge he's revealed himself to us and we're responding to that revelation, right? We believe, uh, like when you read the, the uh, Tanakh of the Old Testament, God revealed himself to Moses. He revealed himself to Abraham. He revealed himself to Jewish people who delivered him out of Egypt. They had seen his mighty deeds, his miracles. They they responded to that revelation. We're supposed to worship them, right? Now, obviously, some of them fell into idolatry again. That's all another topic. But the point is that we respond to what God has revealed to us. God has to communicate to us. Otherwise, we'd know what he's like. Just like none of you on this call would have any friendships with anybody unless you talk to them, unless you wrote to them, unless you emailed them, unless you spent some time with them, you never got married to anybody unless you initiated the relationship, had a girlfriend without a relationship or whatever. The point is that God has to communicate to us, and we believe he's done that, and we're responding to that revelation. Now, obviously, I, I don't think if, you know, if you think about these different claims of different faiths, um, I don't think, for example, like Muhammad in the sixth century, six centuries after the time of Jesus, got a revelation in a cave from the angel Gabriel, and he wrote it down in the Quran. I, I don't think that's a real revelation from God or Allah. I don't, I don't think that really happened. Um, because when I read the Quran, um, there's so many things in the Quran that contradict the New Testament. And one of them is that Jesus never died. The Quran says Jesus literally never died on a crucifixion stake. They said that it was made out to be somebody else. And all uh, uh, the disciples were deceived. They thought it was Jesus, but it really wasn't Jesus. It was somebody else. So there's a substitute, someone in place of Jesus. So I can't accept the Quran as a revelation from God because the Quran completely contradicts the New Testament, the previous revelation over there, six centuries earlier, which is written by first century witnesses that saw Jesus, saw him crucified, wrote it down um, in that century, in that culture. I don't accept a, a revelation six centuries later by a guy that didn't know any of the first century disciples, didn't know anything about Jesus, and claimed that the angel di uh, Gabriel dictated it to him. Um, so that's the biggest problem I have with Islam, and I talk to Muslims about it all the time. I, so I do not believe God gave new revelations after Jesus came. There's like all these different revelations in the world. God uh, spoke over here, revealed himself over here, and raised up another faith over here and over here. And this one contradicts this one. This one contradicts that one. They all contradict each other. And I, if God really wants people to come to know him, then he'd be confusing the world. That's what he's doing because they're all contradictory. So you can't really believe that uh, it's hard to accept the belief that there's new revelation occurring after the time of the Messiah comes, all these different revelations, the Mormon revelation, the Muslim revelation, this revelation over here, you know, it doesn't make any sense, okay? Um, but God's uh, raising up a new prophet. Well, why does he need to raise up a new prophet? Jesus is the final prophet. I mean, there's nothing new God needs to say, okay? The canon, the Bible's canon's closed. We have the Bible. The final revelation came to the person of Jesus. There's nothing more to say. I mean, Jesus rose from the dead. He went to be with God. He authorized the apostles to write it. And it's done. Okay. And so that's why I don't accept any new revelation. Um, so do we worship the same God? Um, in one sense, no, as I say here, because um, obviously for Muslims, God is one, but they're Unitarian. They don't accept the Trinity. So 
in some ways they're and they also believe they, to believe in uh anything ascribed next to Allah like another partner like a son like the son of God or anything is is shirk it's blasphemy Allah has no partners okay he doesn't help need help from anybody so in one sense I would say no um that we definitely I when people say Muslims and Christians worship the same God that's completely false and one and at least in a if you look at it that way there's no way okay um now let me go this a little deeper so you know, do we, what about Christians, Messianic Jews, Muslims, traditional Jews all worship the same God? Um, I'd say at one level, yes, to the extent, if we agree there's only one God, um, but the question becomes, as I say, number three here, are, is the Quran and the, you know, rabbinic descriptions of God similar to the biblical descriptions of God? Are they really saying the same thing? Um, you know, we believe that there is a uh, a creator, you know, Muslims believe it's some sort of, you know, God's a creator, Allah's a creator. Yeah, we can agree with him on that. Um, and we agree that God's omnipotent, he's omniscient, you know, something like that. But if you look at number two here, we, um, we don't necessarily agree on the nature of God, as I said. It's different. We believe God is Trinitarian. So in one sense, we simply cannot say that we all worship the same God. The worship is to believe, as I said, what God's revealed to us. And we believe God's revealed himself through the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So that's the major disagreement is the doctrine of the Trinity. And of course, who Jesus is. We believe he's deity as well, that he's God incarnate. So obviously we don't agree. We just don't agree. We don't see it the same way. Um, you know, I, I don't really, I think it's kind of lazy thinking to say that we all just worship the same God. I mean, you got to be a little clear on what you mean by that, okay? If we go back here, like I said, if you ascribe, you know, you worship what God has revealed to us and has directed us, then if God has revealed himself through you know, the, his nature being a trinity and the deity of Jesus, then obviously we can't say we're worshiping the same. Um, so as I say here, you know, Christian Messianic Judaism believe, we believe God, Jesus is God and man. He's the second person of the trinity. Traditional Judaism believes Jesus is no more than a rabbi, teacher, prophet, some cases a false prophet or just another failed messianic figure, okay? That's a traditional view in Judaism. Of course, we can respond to that. Then Islam, Jesus, of course, is just a great prophet. That's all he is, right? So different views of Jesus. And so, um, you know, if biblically, if we read the New Testament, hopefully you've read the book of John or any other parts of the New Testament, especially the book of John, you can't reject the son and worship the father. You can't come to the father without the son. The father is the God of Israel, okay? And so nobody who, anybody rejects the deity of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, um, we couldn't say they, they're responding to the God who's fully revealed himself, right? And of course, Muslims will agree with me about that. They don't accept Jesus' death and resurrection as deity, neither do Orthodox Jews. Um, so, you know, to one extent, we really, we can't say we're worshiping the same God in some, to a certain extent, okay? So we just need to remember that. Um, if you're going to be honest, I mean, unless you want to try to, you know, say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. I mean, it's all the same. You're not being really intellectually honest. You're not really looking at scripture, depending what your view of scripture is. Okay. Now, um, and then, like I said, Buddhism believes that uh, Jesus was an enlightened man, but not God. And Hinduism said Jesus was a good teacher and perhaps an incarnation of Brahman, which like was like Brahman, which is like an impersonal supreme being. In Buddhism and in Hindus, we have kind of an impersonal force, you know, not really a personal God of any kind. Um, and they like, the, I mean, they're fine with that, but uh, we believe in a personal God who's a father. And in some religions, as you know, other faiths, um, some people believe they had a private experience like Muhammad, like I just said, it's a private personal vision or experience with the angel Gabriel or whatever it is. Then they write about it or that, no, then they go tell others, you know, they tell everyone what they saw. So it starts out as a private revelation. Um, in our faith, we believe that uh, everything happened in the public square, that Jesus was killed, crucified publicly. Everybody saw it. After he came out of the tomb, he was, uh, wit he was seen by many, many people, many witnesses. He publicly showed himself to many people in the public. Um, not everybody, but you know, he showed himself to people different locations. And then they wrote what they saw. Um, the, the, you know, then they, the apostles went off and told others what they'd seen. Now, Paul did have that personal experience on the Damascus Road. Of course, there, obviously, there's other people around him when it happened, um, you know, people that didn't see what he saw, but something, there were people around, then he, but Paul corroborated with the other apostles what had happened. So the whole, our whole faith isn't dependent on Paul, what happened to him. It's built on multiple apostles 
their experiences with Jesus and seeing the risen Jesus, right? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the um, the issue of the exclusivism, um, uh, inclusivism debate. Um, so what about people, the, uh, the destiny of the unevangelized, people that can never, may never hear the good news? Um, you know, people in other countries, they're never exposed to the gospel. They just don't know. You know, they never hear about it. Um, you know, do we need to send somebody to every aspect of the country, every country there is, and unless someone hears it from us or another missionary, they just simply can't come to faith in Jesus. You know, they're doomed, right? Uh, one view, number three here, is universalism believes that everybody would be okay at the end. They don't even need to believe, have faith in Jesus. God will just save them no matter what. Um, I've done a teaching on that too. There's a YouTube clip. But anyway, I can show some problems with that in another time. Now, there's some really good books that have come out over the years. You can get some of these if you want to go deeper. Um, there's no way I can cover everything about this tonight, some of the debates about this. But anyway, you'll get the slide set from this uh, tomorrow anyway. You can look at this. But there's one view, of, we call it exclusivism. This is the belief that we believe, as I said earlier, that God provides salvation only in Jesus. And not only that, that people need to know, they need to hear about Jesus and know about him and then exercise faith in him, right? So what they need to know, they need to hear. You know, they, need, I, they can't believe what they don't know. And so they need to hear about Jesus. They need to know about him and then they need to make a decision for him. That's why we send people and that's why people tell others. And that's about many of you came to faith, right? Um, so the, preaching the gospel or apostolic proclamation or just proclamations is, is the primary means the way God reaches people, okay? Um, and then you kind of have another view. Uh, well, then when people say this, of course, the exclusivist view, it seems that People believe that uh, the afterlife, uh, some version of hell is like Dante's Inferno. Um, but, you know, it looks like this. And it seems like it's awfully not fair that if people don't hear about Jesus, they're condemned forever. I mean, I'm, I'm using a caricature. This is a character people have of what uh, the afterlife looks like. That's that's a caricature, right? Um, so um, that's not that's not what I'm saying. It looks like, I'm saying as it comes up in people's minds, they'll say, well, you're saying God is going to judge or torture someone forever for not believing in Jesus or not even they're not able to hear about it. that sounds terrible first of all God's not torturing anybody that's not what it is and secondly it's not what it looks like so that's that's another topic for another time but the point is that when it comes to exclusivism um generally you know a lot of the the emphasis is on proclamation like I said you have the Romans 10 13 passage or chapter 10 verse 13 to 16 about how they call on the name of the Lord if they don't hear about him and Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How they hear without a preacher. You read that context of Acts 10, or Romans chapter 10. And it makes it sound obviously like people, you know, they, they need to hear. You know, a preacher needs to go and tell them, right? Paul's saying they need to be sent. You know, and that's how they come to faith. And that's the that's primary way people attain a relationship with God. And Paul's right. I mean, Paul is right about that passage. People need to go. They need to proclaim. I mean, you know, when someone's not going to hear generally without someone telling them. Um, and so you also read in the book of John, there's a lot of stress on believing in Jesus. There's, it's over a hundred times, but studio that people need to trust and believe they need to have saving faith. They need to believe there's a lot of emphasis on believing in Jesus throughout the book of John. Um, you know, Jesus stresses that over and over and over having belief, proper belief, having saving faith. So anyway, um, so that's, um, you know, we just need to remember that. Okay. All right. So in exclusivism to kind of summarize, it, it really says that only by hearing and believing in Jesus during this life, people can attain salvation. So that means the, the commission is to us. It's only up to us to share with others. That's how they're going to come to faith. We must just go do it. Um, we have no other alternative. So that would mean that basically that I, the burden, there's a very strong uh, responsibility on us. God uses us, but he chooses to use us out of his grace, but there's a much stronger emphasis on us uh, participating in what God's doing, obeying God. Now, this can lead to two things. It can lead to legalism, where, you know, people are just like always, uh, every day, they're like, oh my gosh, if I don't share my faith with five people a day, then everyone's going to, going to be a part, going to be in hell or something. I'm a terrible believer, and I stink, and God's mad at me, and I have to talk to every coworker I have about the Lord. 
I won't even do my job. I'll just start talking about Jesus right there and get fired. Um, or, uh, you know, wherever we go, we just have to talk about Jesus everywhere we go. So sometimes it can lead to that, which can be a little imbalanced. You know what I mean? We need to just calm down a little bit here. Okay. Slow down a little bit. And, you know, we need to understand that uh, we need to just, you know, need, need to understand, yes, we need to share, we're called to share, but we don't want to make it into a legalistic thing, okay? Now, there's another view called in inclusivism. This is a kind of a, a response to exclusivism. So it is a belief that, uh, you know, some people could possibly be saved um, if they don't respond to, to uh, what they have in this life. They could be saved if they no, only if they respond to what they know, only what they know to faith in God alone. That's all they know. Like, say you're a Muslim in another country in Saudi Arabia and the gospel can't get to you or the Bible can't get in that country. If all you believe in is what you know, then God won't hold you accountable. I mean, because that's all you know. You know, the gospel it doesn't seem fair. I'm fa fair. You never heard it. You don't know what it is. Um, and then a lot of times in inclu inclusivism stresses what we call general revelation is all, as I will explain more in a moment. That if people believe in a creator, that's all they know. That's good enough. Um, so salvation is possible for people who never heard the gospel. And so, you know, it's kind of like a wider hope view. There's more hope for people that don't have access to the gospel and don't have an opportunity here. What about the, what about the handicapped and others? I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So, but just remember that someone who holds an inclusivist view, an exclusivist view, they all, they all agree that Jesus is the agent of salvation. That's not the issue. They just disagree on how much the person needs to know. Okay, how much do they have to know in order to be saved? Um, and so one thing is the inclusivists have always said that there's people, it seems like, in the Old Testament that didn't know about Jesus. You take Abraham, Moses, uh, Melchizedek, other one, just everybody, really. You know, how are they saved? I mean, how did they have a relationship with God? How did they know they were right with God? Jesus hadn't come yet. They couldn't trust in Jesus, right? They couldn't hear the gospel. So it seems like those people are okay. Well, it seems like there's, there's a, some sort of way for other people who don't have access to the gospel, if they believe maybe just in God alone, maybe that's good enough. That's what they say. And so maybe people don't need to consciously hear or believe in the gospel to be saved. You know, some people, that's what inclusivism sometimes says. And what about, they also say, what about the infants? What about people who don't have the mental capacities? What about, as I just mentioned, unreached people in third world countries? What about people who are just sincere? That's all they know. Or what about, you know, we're supposed to, what about, what's the human responsibility part? Of what's God's sovereignty here? And so they bring up some good points. I agree that, you know, these are things to think about. It's not, they shouldn't just be brushed aside. Um, but just remember a couple things here. When we talk about general revelation, um, this is how God can be known through creation, that everybody can know there's a creator just looking at the world around them or looking at the universe or looking at physical nature, human nature. They can know there's some sort of creator. Um, just like I grew up for 24 years believing in a creator, I no doubt there's a creator just walking down the street of my neighborhood or looking at a sunset or just experiencing nature outside, not worshiping it, but just I just, creation was just obvious to me. There had to be a God behind that. It just bore witness to me, like Romans 1 talked about. And so then you have special revelation where that is a greater revelation that God gives. Uh, just after creation, God decides to reveal more of himself, and he brings a person in the world, the person of the Messiah, right? Then we have the Bible. That's more revelation. It's written down. And then we have messengers that go tell people about this revelation. And so God uses people to communicate this revelation. And then in some cases, some people have dreams and visions today. In Muslim countries where people can't get the gospel of them, they're having dreams and visions about Jesus, who he is. And some Muslims get saved that way, right? And so they, God uses that. He reaches them through a dream or a vision. I, there's a book about it. I, I've seen it. So some third world countries are places where there's no gospel, no Bibles. God's reaching them through a supernatural means. He can do that. God's not limited, right? Um, and so when it comes to those that have never heard, um, we know that God is just, we know he wants everyone to be saved, that's his desire, everyone knows, should know there's a creator, as I'll talk about more in a minute, um, and everybody, because of what Romans 1 says in Psalm 19, and also everybody knows there's a moral law or conscience, as Paul talks about in Romans 2, so, so everyone in this world should 
the Bible says they know there's a God through creation and conscience. They know there's some sort of God. Now, you may say, well, I don't believe in that. I mean, I don't, that's ridiculous. You're telling me something I don't believe. So I don't know that. Well, what that basically is saying is God has revealed himself. He's shown himself to be real through the gift of creation. You can look at the created world and the moral law and know. Now, you may reject that, but obviously that's going to take some serious work to show that uh, nature and chance pulled off the universe and the world we have to live in without any mind behind it. And we all know that a moral law exists because we're constantly complaining about how everything immoral is around the world, how people are doing unjust things. So your conscience, you, you, you know, your conscience is being violated. So I'll expand on that in a minute. But the problem is that if we only leave it up to general revelation for people to come to faith through that way, through creation and conscience, we know that Paul says in Romans 1 about creation that people reject it. <laughs> they suppress the truth. And they basically dismiss it. You know, if you read the Romans 1 context, Paul says, then they fall into idolatry. They reject the creator and then they go right into idolatry. And, uh, you know, they don't accept it. That God has clearly revealed himself through the gift of creation. They don't even accept that, right? And then in conscience, sometimes people reject their conscience, right? Through willful sin. Um, sometimes their conscience becomes seared. It becomes like uh, if you took a pin a long pin and tried to hit your hand like that, you just don't feel anything after a while, right? Because it's so numb, because your conscience has become dull. That's like an analogy. And so people can reject these things. They do. I do with people all the time. They rejected creation and their conscience. Um, it's not pretty. So it does happen. But if you look at general revelation, Romans one, you know, it's, it's very clear. It teaches that, uh, you know, the God of the Bible, he, there's a God, he exists. Um, he created the universe. Um, it seems like he's personal in some way. He's loving. Um, an impersonal deity couldn't reveal himself in any way. An impersonal deity isn't personal, right? He's just like an impersonal force like Star Wars. Doesn't even have any personality characteristics. <laughs> um, God is a moral being from what we get out of Romans 1. And then if you read on in Romans 2 and 3, people violated that moral law or guilty. So it seems that there's some things people definitely know about God through just creation and the moral law. And remember the condemnation that Paul lists there in Romans 1 and 2, that's not about hearing the gospel and refusing. It's about knowing that they should know God, but they refuse him. They, they just push God away, right? And so it is true that, uh, as I say, number two here, we shouldn't be judged on something we never knew. It seems like that wouldn't be fair. But it seems like as we see in Romans 1 and 2, people do know a great deal about God. They do know things about God. They're not, it's not like they can't look around and when they stand before God one day, I just never knew anything about you. I didn't know anything that you're like. I never could know anything about you. Romans 1 and 2 says the same, say the opposite. Okay, the exact opposite. Okay, the people do know there's a God and they're, they're just pushing him away every day because they don't want to be morally accountable to him. Um, I said that to someone yesterday. They argued to me over the design of the universe. And they said, well, well, we create things all around us all the time. Look at the world. I mean, we create buildings and do stuff. So we're the ones that create. And I, I was like, yeah. So who created the universe and the world you live in that allows you to be here today, like right now talking to me? And they said, oh, that's, that's not God. That's just chance. Really interesting. So it takes humans to create buildings and things like that, but it takes no mind behind the universe of creator. Interesting. I thought building a universe would be way harder than building a building. That would take a lot more work, a lot more planning, a lot more planning. It takes a lot of planning to plan out your life. Multiply that by just keep going, going, going. The government tries to plan things and screw it up. We know that. So planning's everywhere. Think of a universe, the way the universe has to be planned out, right? Um, but what about the people in the Old Testament? Let me mention something about that. So it is true that uh, they did not have access to the gospel because Jesus hadn't come yet. But, you know, the way they were right with God, uh, they believed in that the object of their faith was the God of Israel. And if they exercised faith in him, that's what they knew. That's what they knew. And that's how they were right with God. Um, God counted it, you know, they by faith they trusted in the god of abraham isaac and jacob that's the revelation they had at that time right that's all they knew and that's fine nothing wrong with that god doesn't judge you. oh you should have known about jesus back then no he hadn't come yet 
So obviously that's before Jesus comes. But we know that what happens is, as we move on the timeline, that uh, God reveals himself in a greater way through progressively revealing himself and ultimately the Messiah comes. And so what that means is that there's more revelation of God to humanity. And, you know, and if you ever read Acts 17, Paul talks about, you never know, notice that part where he's, well, if you read Acts 17, it's a great passage. He's walking around Athens and he's provoked by the idolatry because he's a Torah observant, monotheistic Jewish man, of course. And he knows that they're worshiping false gods. And he sees those statues there, those little altars. And he says, he talks about what you worship. You know, you talk about, he says, you to an, or he sees the uh, little altar that says to an unknown God. Paul sees that there. And, un, and so, you know, if you look at some of the different things, if you study the archaeological evidence, the people in Athens that Paul was surrounded by worship just had all kinds of different things they worshiped, um, different God or different unknown gods. And if you read Acts 17 in context, Paul turns around and says, well, you know, this is the God I proclaim to you. He says, the one true God made everything. He starts making a case for a personal God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? But then do you notice what Paul says at the end of Acts 17? He says basically at the end of Acts 17 that, you know, the, the part where he says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, this is the end of Acts 17, you can read in your Bible. Gee, Eric, I didn't know that. Therefore, over, over, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he's fixed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So notice that Paul says that with the coming of the Messiah, you know, there's more accountability now. I mean, everything's changed. God's program has changed. His salvation plan has, you know, there's more revelation, okay? And so you can't just point back, well, people were saved in the Old Testament because, and they didn't believe in Jesus. Well, that was then. That was, see, that was back there. Like if I go back to the slice set here, you know, if you go back, that, that was back there, right? More revelation has come now with the coming of Messiah. Now people have a greater accountability, right? And so, you know, that's very important that we understand that. And, you know, as we give out another proof text here, as much as I don't like proof texting, you know, in Hebrews 1, 1 to 2, it says, God has spoken to us in these last days through his son. You know, God spoke. That's who he's speaking to today. I mean, he's still speaking through the Messiah, okay? And so, he is the final revelation of God, the full revelation of God, and the final revelation of God. Okay, there's no new prophets, no new revelation coming. We don't need uh, a revelation in the 6th century. We don't need one in the, in the 18th century from Joseph Smith. We don't need another revelation. We don't need another prophet. God's given us all the revelation we need in the person of the Messiah. Um, so, you know, if you've got an argument, you can show me in the New Testament that God promises new, new revelation that will contradict the old one. Let me know where you see it. I can't find it, okay? Um, now, some people in Mormonism and other Islam, they'll say, well, you had to have a new revelation because the older one got corrupted. They'll say the New Testament's corrupted, which I respond, show me where it's corrupted. Where is it corrupted? Show me. Where is it? Well, do we just know it's been changed? Well, show me where it's been changed. Sometimes they just don't even know. They're just repeating what they've been told. Um, okay. What about people who are sincere? I mean, you may run into a lot of sincere people that, uh, you know, believe in a certain faith. That's all they know. Seem like they're kind. Um, you know, that I'm, it's fine they're sincere, but, you know, being sincere doesn't believe mean what you believe is true. You can be sincerely wrong, of course. So, um, you know, let's take an example of Cornelius, you know, in Acts chapter 10. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, he was a sincere, he believed in the right God. You know, he worshiped the God of Israel, right? He prayed to the God of Israel. That's what Acts 10 says. God heard his prayers. He had his object of his faith was in the right God, but he didn't know the gospel yet. And then what God do, God sent him Peter in Acts chapter 10 and Cornelius heard the gospel and became a believer. So he responded. He, you know, he's believing in the right God. And God said, okay, you, you responded to the, I'm the true creator. Now I'm going to send you in a missionary. It's going to be Peter. He's going to give you the full, the gospel. And uh, that's what happened with Cornelius. So, you know, but other people that, you know, if you say, well, they're just so sincere about it and they believe it, they seem so sincere. Well, you know, I have no doubt people's sincerity, but it doesn't mean what they believe is true. I mean, they're, being sincere doesn't mean they're necessarily believing something is true. 
Um, now, what about people that have no access to the gospel, like Muslims in other countries, like I said, Saudi Arabia, or what about people who are handicapped of a mental defect? Well, as I said, God has certainly other ways to reach those people. I mean, he's reaching Muslims through dreams and visions. And if we don't reach them through a missionary, God can still reach them. God is not limited just to us. Now, it's true he generally uses us is the main way to reach people, uses us as people. But he's not limited to that. He can use other means if he has to, okay? And so now that doesn't mean you can just sit around for the rest of your Christian life and just say, well, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to talk to anybody about the Lord ever again because God will reach him regardless. Well, yeah, he could reach him if he wants to. God can do whatever he wants. But one thing you have to remember, you miss out on the blessing and uh, you miss out on God using you. And it's a, it can definitely build your faith up and make you stronger in your faith and you see God working. Um, and also it's just an issue of being faithful, right? Um, so I have no doubt that uh, God, when people bring up the guy on the island, you ever hear that? What about the guy on the island never hears it? I'm like, yeah, what about him? God knows who he is. Is God limited? God knows exactly who that guy is. Um, what about you, by the way? What do you believe? That's what I say. We're talking about you. Um, but God has definitely enough knowledge to know who knows what, where they are geographically, who's heard about the gospel, who knows about him. He's not ignorant. You know, he's like, oh, I just didn't know about, I didn't know about those 10 people over there in that country that didn't have access to a Bible. I didn't know about that guy on the island. That caught me off guard. No, he, he knows everybody is. He's more than capable of sending people to them, and he does, he's fair and makes no mistakes. God is not going to make mistakes in judgment. He knows how much light somebody has. He knows much, how much exposure somebody has. So you don't have to worry about God making mistakes, okay? <laughs> or I feel like some, some people are uninjured, just like, oh, what is going to happen to that? Well, gee, it's if God is caught off guard, okay? He's a much larger God than we take him to be, and he can do whatever he wants. But he knows what people know how much they know and how much they don't know, okay? And so just you do your part and share and leave it to God. Um, you know, it, like I say, if people can't be reached by a missionary or person, God is holy and just. He knows who's heard. Our response number two here is to just be obedient and share the gospel and let God worry about those who can't be reached, okay? He has a way to reach them if he wants to reach them, okay? So I'm not worried about it. Um, one thing you do need to remember, though, is that you know, when we take the initiative to preach the gospel, when we're the ones that are obedient, um, you know, you have to remember that it talks, the Bible talks about the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. It talks about coming out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Someone's transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. They don't have the light of the gospel, right? So you sharing the gospel with somebody is a power encounter. Now, you may not see it that way. There's no lightning bolt that comes down from the sky. But the point is that say, there's blindness over their eyes. And you share the gospel, the gospel is power in itself, not you. And the gospel is what brings them out of the kingdom of darkness, right? And they're, they're blinded, right? And so only the Holy Spirit can open their eyes. But the point is that uh, you know, the gospel is powerful. And the main way it reaches people is through proclamation, okay? Um, God has so many things around the world now. He's using technology and everything. But the point is that, um, you know, there's no way. So let me summarize here a little bit. So we talked a little bit about uh, that all the faiths, they have different claim, truth claims. They all can't be the same. Um, they're all making different truth claims. Um, and then secondly, of course, uh, you know, the, the exclusivist claim is uh, generally the most uh, tr the, the most common one people hold to that of course Jesus is the only way which inclusivists believe as well. It's just uh, what about myself? Well, I'm I'm generally exclusivist. Of course, I believe that Jesus is the only way, and I think that the the main way God reaches people is through missionary or someone talking. However, I do believe that people, if they don't hear about it and they don't have access to the gospel, God can use another way. There's no doubt about it. I don't. I have no doubt that God's not limited to me but i don't believe that uh it's good enough just to believe it's going to be good enough just to believe in a creator like what i talked about here of uh general revelation you know because i think people don't always respond to general revelation it's not enough just to believe in a creator and that's it um so i think you definitely need to uh, go further and believe in who jesus is of course for believing a creator is a first step 
if they don't, if they're an atheist, you want to take them to believe in a creator, that's the goal, then you could take them to who Jesus is, okay? So um, this is some of the things that come up. Um, I would say in today's culture right now, where we're at, uh, there's no doubt that people are big on this one. Um, it's still around. I see it everywhere. A lot of times they complain that different faiths cause war and conflict and disagreement, and hatred and bigotry, which can happen. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, they all can be true. I mean, it's just they all make different claims. You know what I mean? So we can, yeah, we can live in harmony with people. I can live with Jewish people that don't believe in Jesus or Muslims or Mormons. But <clears throat> the point is that we have to agree that we just aren't saying the same thing. And I, I appreciate when people say that to me when I talk to a Muslim. He says, yeah, we just don't agree on who Jesus is. You believe he's the son of God. We don't. You believe he died. We don't believe he really died. Let's just be honest with each other. He's just dead honest, you know, versus trying to act. Well, I don't want to offend you. I mean, if I say Jesus, you know, we just basically kind of believe the same thing. Like, no, we don't. You're not being honest. So stop, stop trying to do that. Okay. It, it doesn't help anyone. All right. Um, so having said that, um, let me go to some discussion points here and, uh, we can have a nice long conversation. I ended early because I covered everything there was. So everyone can, uh, just start chiming in whatever you want. Nobody's ever heard this objection. Have they, by Jesus being the only way nobody, right? Ever. That's a bad joke. That's a bad joke. Does everybody, um, heard this pretty regularly you can write in the chat room yes eric all the time anybody nobody's talking is everyone eating cheerios right now are you like you putting in the background you fix something to eat like pizza or soup or something anybody want to comment earl said yes eric all the time see earl admitted it thank you earl anybody have ian crawford Yes, Eric, all the time. See, now I've got two. See, I told them what to say, and now they're saying it. How about that? Anybody? Uh, Diana, yes, coexist sign, definitely up all over public schools. Wow, they have in schools too? Yes. I usually see it as bumper stickers, right, Tom? See them on cars, bumper stickers? Yeah, I, you're, you're muted, by the way. And you're, if you're muted, you got to mute yourself. Um, anyway, but anybody else? Eric, just a quick question, Tim, yeah. Tim Smith. Um, what, what are your thoughts about um, this kind of a, an innate part of us that makes us, that we're born with, that wants to make us sort of worship something? So is that how we're judged? Uh, even if we've not heard the gospel, but God would kind of use that in terms of how we respond to that sort of... Uh, innate part of us that makes us want to worship something or someone well i think that when it comes to that as i you know as i talked about here i said that um i think that goes back to general revelation definitely that um our desire to worship something comes you know when it you really look at romans one romans two um trying to yeah right here I think that that's part of general revelation, that all people seem to worship, reach up to some sort of deity, whether they don't even know who the God is, right? They worship God through something. You know, they worship a, the guy on the island or somewhere in a remote jungle. Um, I think that's part of general revelation that God has put that in people, you know, to do that. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can be saved through that. I mean, that's... Um, General, I mean, obviously, we believe that God brought more revelation through Jesus, and people need to hear about Jesus. Now, I just, as I just said, and I ended with, obviously, if some people doesn't don't have access to that message and they're cut off from it, God definitely will judge them fairly, and He knows what they know. So that may be all they have. You know, He could apply the atonement or what Jesus has done to that person if they have no access to the gospel. I don't believe God's out there to be like, "You never heard about it. I'm going to get you." <laughs> You never heard about the gospel. I'm ready to pounce on you. No, he's fair. He knows who knows what and how much light they've had. But uh, so I think he'll judge them accordingly. I mean, that's kind of like what I already said. Do you agree? Or I don't know if that would are you trying to, is that what you're kind of trying to ask? Are you there? Yeah, yes, it was. Uh, to be honest, yeah, I, I agreed with everything you said. Uh, but um, we have to yeah, yeah, you yeah, agree yeah, with it. Yeah, then well, you can't it's, call. Exactly. So, <laughs> Bad joke. Yeah. 
absolutely but uh, yeah yeah so it, it was just in terms of those people that may not have had the opportunity of hearing so uh it was just the thought really because i i know people say we have got that innate part of us you know that makes us want to worship something so uh, yeah we, i yeah. agree everybody worships something i mean everyone's got a god you know what i mean i <laughs> don't you think so in general oh, absolutely yeah, Absolutely. but I think though, like I said at the end there, I think for people who haven't heard about it, have no access to, it, I think God can reach them another way if He wants to, and He is doing that. Muslim countries is doing it, but in the U.S., let's take like the U.S., we don't have that problem. We have more Bibles here that you can get your hands on. We have more access to the gospel, more material, sermons, technology. I mean, we are just saturated with things. So I don't think a lot of people are gonna have a lot of excuses in the u.s as many you know what i mean so um now that doesn't mean that we don't need to share with people I and mean, i talk to people all the time on campus who never heard the gospel they don't even know what it is and they're around people this country all the time they have access to it all now a lot of people have but a lot of some people have it but you know we still need to realize people need to hear it we can't assume anybody knows it right yeah um i don't know does that kind of answer your question jim Absolutely, totally. Yeah, it's just a comment, to be honest. Okay, Ian says in the chat room, comment on people who say there is no truth, if only truth is there is no truth. Can, how can you justify this when none of the other statements support your position? Can be Well, that's what I said to that person, Ian. I basically said to her, she said, there is no truth. And I said, well, is that true? And then she said, well, wait a minute. I said, yeah, you just said there's no truth, but you're saying you know there's no truth. So which is it? I mean, she... Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's called a self-defeating uh, statement. It doesn't meet its own standard. It's like saying uh, there is no absolute truth. Is that absolutely true? You know, that doesn't, you can just respond, is that absolutely true? You're not trying to be snarky, but uh, it doesn't meet its own criteria. Um, you know, if someone says all truth is relative, you, you say, you know, well, is that a relative truth? If all truth is relative, what you just said is relative. So, you know, that. You go on and on with those statements. They don't. They don't make a lot of sense. Um, someone might say you should question everything. I might say, can I question what you just said? Should I question what you just said that we should question everything? So you know, it, these statements are just not. They don't hold up to their own standard. Um, all right, Diana says <coughs> I can comment a little more on the Islam view of the Bible as well, if that is something interesting. Um, Okay, well, I don't know if you want to write in the chat room. I mean, I, yeah, we've. Yeah, I, I could talk about it. So like okay, go of, ahead. One of my friends is Muslim. Okay. And, um, she was actually the one who started trying to talk to me about religion. Initially, I just helped her write essays. Um, but she tried, started trying to convert me to Islam. And um, I obviously give her the position views from the Bible. But her first wall is that she doesn't um, believe in the Bible, because like, as you said, their view is that it's corrupted or that um, like, I feel like she doesn't really know what she believes, but um, she tells me that the Quran is quote, quote, the latest version of the truth. So she won't even bother reading the Bible or um, like either old or new Testament. And for her, it's good enough with what she's got. So I just think it's really interesting that, um, you know, she has this high respect for God um, or in her case, um, Allah, but she won't go to the roots of the faith. You know, she won't even um, read up where it comes from to, you know, like know for sure if if her Quran is, is truly anything like um, credible. So there's just something. Yeah, I agree. I think that's kind of the way I run with Muslims. It's the same thing. They haven't really looked into it a lot. It's kind of like they're kind of told something. This is what you believe. But if you actually read the Quran, it actually affirms a lot of things in the bible <laughs> so to say that she just dismisses it all like it's corrupt is not the islam muslim understanding of the bible um the muslims do hold to um that the, the uh the uh, torah is inspired that uh it's you know uh, it, it, they don't hold that the whole bible is corrupted um they don't believe that so i don't know why she's saying that and if you look at the clip I just posted here in your YouTube in the in the uh, comments section called the Islamic dilemma by David Wood he's a specialist to Muslims he talks about that that it's a dilemma they have because in the Quran it affirms the gospel in a way because they affirm very a lot of parts of the Bible is being true and so they can't 
you know, it's kind of like it kind of puts them in a situation. But in your friend's situation, wouldn't you agree? She probably just doesn't know, right? And the question is, does she really care whether it's true, right? You know what I mean? Wouldn't you agree? It's a question of whether she's kind of like a truth seeker, right? Yeah, definitely. And it seems like it scares her to try to think otherwise, which I find very interesting because if you're trying to seek the truth, you know, wouldn't you give ear to it, um, especially coming from the Bible, which is where our faith originally comes from right but i i would say though i know the quran affirms a lot of this stuff from the bible so it doesn't think it's just all corrupted i mean it it's just not true at all um generally when they say corrupted when i deal with muslims it's always just the new testament they don't they have problems with like the new they never say the whole bible though that's kind of new one i've heard unless she was referring maybe she meant to say to you the new testament i don't know maybe she just didn't word it right you'd have to ask her I'm not sure. But, you know, we saw a Muslim girl on campus today. Um, she was very open, very moderate Muslim, not hardcore practicing, you know, no head covering or anything, just kind of very moderate. And uh, she was very open to talk about the gospel. And my friend shared with her for a long time. And she actually came to faith in the Lord. But that's someone who's not, who's seeking and is open someone who's just like a muslim and i can't even look into it because i'm not allowed you know she was open right and uh, but i do run into many muslims like your friend the other kind you know they're just are just afraid there's a lot of pressure on them to you know believe a lot more social pressure they could ostracize from their family so it's tough yeah so the best thing to do is just be a friend to her and just see if you can have those conversations right yeah, yeah but check out that video i put in the uh, chat room the islamic dilemma do you see it Yes. Yeah, clip. Yeah, check that out and see if that makes any sense. It's pretty cool. Um, where are you located? Oh, we're in uh, Flushing, New York. Really? Yeah. Flushing, New York, where they used to play the U.S. Open. Right, Tom? Wasn't it Flushing? We're tennis fans. So we remember it was, used to be located years ago in the 70s. <laughs> Back a long time ago. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, you might run into a lot of Jewish people there too in Flushing, I think. I don't know. Is there a large Jewish population there in Flushing? Um, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. We are in Flushing, not really, but like in another part of Queens, there are more. Queen, oh, yeah, definitely in that area. Yeah, in, in uh, Kew Gardens is particularly a, a Jewish stronghold and Forest Hills. Right, Forest Hills. Forest Hills, Tom. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay, well, that's great. Thanks for your question. Good comment. Uh, Ian says, God promises those who will seek will find if they sought and yet never heard about Jesus. There is some jungle somewhere live before Jesus. What happens is promises and how God answers or seeking is not none of our business. Some way God will lead in Jesus. Some way has not been given to us. Well, yeah, that's what I was saying in the presentation. I was just talking about that. I said that God can reach them. Obviously, I mean, you know, if they're, if they're seeking who God is and there's no missionary there to talk to them, there's no Bible you know, that they can, then God obviously can reach them any way he wants. You know, he, if they're really seeking, just like Muslims in countries where you can't get the Bible into, if they're really seeking the truth, God can give them a vision of who Jesus is and they can come to faith that way. I mean, there's, God's a big God. He can do anything he wants. So I agree. It's not our business to know how he answers that. I, I unless they tell us like Muslims sometimes tell other people. So, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of, My that's what I was talking about. Yeah, my point was that Jesus did say, seeking you, find, knock and it will be opened unto you. All those things are definite promises with no conditions on, except that you've got to seek and you've got to find, search, you know? Yeah, I, I, I think that a truly seeking heart that is really seeking whether who God is and who Jesus, I think that God will answer that prayer with the right heart. Not someone who's like, darn it, God, you're going to show me who you are and I'm going to maybe think about following you and Darn it, you know, you owe me a sign or I'm not, you know, not a real arrogant attitude. Someone with a kind of a humble spirit, obviously a humble spirit that's open, very much seeking. I think God will hear that prayer. Um, how he answers it, I don't know. Yeah, I that's mean, why I sometimes think somebody yeah. like Socrates is probably in heaven. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it, nobody knows. Let's face it, we, there's, we just don't know enough about people's final destination I me mean, i don't know how much somebody knows i mean i go if someone tells me during this life that they don't believe in jesus they think it's a joke and they reject him then i'm going to say well my confidence is not really good that you know they're okay now but honestly i don't know 100 for sure i don't i don't know what happens to them in the last 
year of their life or the last two minutes or the last 10 minutes. I don't know. You know what I mean? All I can go by is what they told me. So, but ultimately God is the judge. He knows who knows what, and he is fair and just, and he makes no mistakes. So I, as far as like people, what they know and they don't know, and that's good. All we can do is do our part and let God handle the rest, right? Exactly. So yeah. That's all we can do. That's why I tell people like, stop worrying about the results. Just let God do that. You just, you just share and let God do the rest. So anyway, anybody else, any other comments or questions? They got a new one down here. Let me see your new message. Uh, like what Helen Keller said, she already knew God just didn't know his name till she learned of Jesus. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, yeah, I, I, I guess that's, you could put it that way. I mean, I, I always believed in a creator growing up, you know, I didn't, I didn't know much about that creator, but I certainly knew about him a lot when I came to faith in Jesus, you know, definitely opened my mind. I knew or my heart knowing that I knew who the father was. I always believed in God, no doubt. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's the way it kind of you're saying there. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Salvation is a little bit of a mystery too, right? It's not, you know, how it works and how it all works out. I, I it's, There's some mystery to it, obviously. Anybody else? Comments or questions? Anybody? Eric, you brought up, uh, you just brought up the topic of salvation. And I think that it, as we look at the cross section of uh, the different faiths in, in, the, in the world and particularly in the United States, which is a pluralistic environment, you know, tolerance doesn't necessarily mean acceptance or agreement of other people's faith. But the big question will always be, what, am I, what do I need to be saved from? Isn't right. that the conversation starter that lays the foundation for us to talk about the differences that um, the different views uh, uh, in terms of eternity and, and what plays out? Yeah, um, well, I think that, like I said here, um, where am I? Oh, I'm on the wrong. Okay, I, I just want to pull up that slide there on salvation real quick. I think that when I was talking about this, you know, and I define salvation back here at the very beginning um let's see here it's right there it is um yeah i mean i i think that sometimes or the phrase it to be saved from something is not only to be delivered or rescued from uh, a life that's not holistic a life that's apart from god a life that's not reconciled to god we also want to emphasize what you're saved to not just saved from, it's what you're saved to. You're saved to a life with God, a life of new, a new life with God, a life where you can carry out being an image bearer of God. You can fulfill your calling of the way God created and what you're supposed to do in this world, right? So I think what you need to communicate to people, not just being delivered from a life apart from God, but what they're um, delivered out of what they're saved to. Um, just like uh, we talk about Israel coming out of Exodus, the uh, or Egypt, they were delivered from a life of bondage, you know, the Passover theme, a life of bondage, they were brought into redemption, a new way of living, right? So we need to kind of communicate both of those, I think, what you're delivered from, but what you're saved to. Um, I'm not sure we've done I'm a great job. To a Muslim, uh, they're going to say, I, I already have a relationship with God. I am following the Quran. And uh, therefore, I have, you know, I, I know that when I die, this is where I'm going. I've never heard a Muslim tell me they know where they're going when they die. Not my experience. I've talked to hundreds of them. They have no idea for sure. At least my experience. There's no assurance. They just hope Allah has mercy. That's what they tell me. They just have, there's no assurance in Islam. From what they've told me, unless you're hearing from something different. Is that what, you heard this from this one person or what? I, I don't think I've heard the, the phrase that they felt assured. But yeah, their, their belief is that if they live their life according to the principles, uh, five pillars of Islam, the Quran, that God will have mercy on them and they will find and, and martyrdom is another, uh, you know, quick, quick. It's sort of the express pass to to uh, <laughs> to. Eat. Well, yeah, but I mean, yeah, I agree. They might say that if they, they keep the five pillars, yeah, they'll say I. Hoping Allah has mercy on me, 
they'll, they'll still say to me, of course, they don't know for sure. It's just they're hoping, you know what I mean? So they don't have the kind of assurance that we have. Obviously, we, well, we stress assurance of your salvation. Um, but it doesn't really matter to me so much. I mean, anybody you can say, I have the, I believe this, this, and this. And the, the evident, question is, what's the evidence for it? I mean, you know, I don't really, just because you're sincere about it and you practice it, that's what you believe. That doesn't mean necessarily it's true. I mean, I could, they don't think what I believe is true. That's why we have a disagreement over who Jesus is, right? So if I always bring up the issue with the Quran, I mean, if, if the Quran says Jesus never died, then, you know, I, I've sat there with Muslims till I'm blue and not, I mean, not till I'm blue in my face, but for hours at our local community college, giving them evidence for the death of Jesus, first century evidence, documents, Josephus, other things, showing them he really died, eyewitness testimony. And then I show him the Quran verse that says he never died. I said, how can you believe a book that's six centuries later, um, you know, after the time of Jesus? That just, historians, that just makes no sense in historical method. It doesn't make any sense what we know. And they say, well, it's just what the Quran says. I can't accept that. You know what I mean? That's six centuries later. And, no, that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh just one second, please. I'm sorry. Just a second. Um, give me one second. I, I'll be right back. Guys, uh, hold on. Um, uh, sorry. Family member needed my car keys. Anyway, I had a communication lapse there. But um, yeah, so I, I think with Earl, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you that having talked to Muslims a lot about that, have I had great success? No. I'll tell you why, because they, um, I think with Muslims, I think the sociological pressure and the family pressure to stay Muslim is so strong. And we had a girl at our community college outreach that came to faith in Jesus. She accepted the Lord. She was a Muslim. Her mom caught whiff of it. Her mom found out. Um, she pulled her out of that school. And we never saw her again. I haven't seen her to this day. Can't, couldn't reach her by texting or anything. We tried to get her to come live with somebody to leave her house. So she'd be, she'd have to basically get away from her family. And right when she was about to do that, um, the family cramped, clamped, you know, just put their foot down and we couldn't reach her. Never seen her since she's vanished. Um, I guess her mom found out that she'd become a Christian and, uh, we don't know where she is to this day. So it's very, very, it's just it's very hard for them to leave that. Um, I mean, logically, if, if someone shows me a document that's six centuries after someone lived and tried to tell me that that's the truth about that person when I have first century evidence that it's true, then most people have any, I mean, just rationally speaking, like what, there's, there's it's a no brainer. I mean, if yeah, first century evidence, Jesus really died by Roman crucifixion. Even the archaeological evidence supports that. And you have the Quran, it's just like a no-brainer, six centuries later. But they just, they don't think that way. They're like, well, the Quran's perfect. It's a perfect revelation from God. I'm like, no, it's not perfect because it contradicts back here. There's all this evidence Jesus really died. And they just, it just doesn't, you know, compute. But they can only come to faith through the Holy Spirit like everybody else. And some of them do if they're seeking, right? So um, it's hard. They're hard to crack. But today we had success with one, but she was seeking. See, that's very, that's not, but that's not the common, you know, it happens every once in a while, right? So um, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question or comment? Earl? Earl left. Anyway, um, I'm on, yeah, uh, anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. You want to share something, Sue? No, go ahead. No, go oh. ahead. He's, I don't happen to Earl. Maybe he'll come back. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to share something basically like uh, we Christians, like we believe uh, that uh, there is one life, right? And uh, only what is done for Christ will last. But uh, I just want to talk about Hinduism. But they, in Hinduism, like they say that after death, there is a million time you have to take a, they, they believe in re. They say that whatever in the creation, like all animals, all bugs, creatures, whatever. Right. So 
Now, every time you have to take a birth, like every whatever the creatures on this earth, every person have to go one time for every animal. Uh, and sometime you would be in a creature, any kind of bugs or uh, creepers or something like you have to do like we have to go like that. So um, there is the uh, belief in Hinduism like a rebirth. But on the other side, they believe that uh, there is a heaven and hell they believe too. So, so one side they are believing that after death you will go either heaven or hell. But the other side they say that you have a million time you have to take a rebirth. Yeah, that, and they, what's in the relation to reincarnation is right, you trying to get your life right, right? You have, if you did something bad, you have to fix it in the next life, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you just keep trying to fix it. So Hitler would it be Hitler if he's reincarnated now it's something else, he'd be living a terrible life now, right? Because he what he did, right? Yeah. Right. But what's the evidence for reincarnation? How do you know that someone's been reincarnated? Exactly. I don't really know what it is. I haven't I don't know how you would kind of show that's happened. You know what yeah. I mean? Like if you look at someone's they're living like a a really difficult life well they must be reincarnated from a bad past life well that's i don't i could explain the suffering in their life in a hundred hundred other ways you know what i mean or challenges you know what i mean i don't know if you could just say well it's reincarnation yeah so um i talked to a hindu girl yesterday for a long time and it was she said she was in a caste system and uh oh, she said it's very strict you yeah, I mean, so um, it's very hard, just like Muslims, it's very hard to come out of that. Exactly. So um, anyway, very interesting discussion. She had a lot of questions, though. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, no one, everyone comes to faith the same way. They have to be seeking. The Holy Spirit has to draw them. And, you know, that's is no different than anybody else. No one's different. There's no special Jewish people, Muslims, Hindus, atheists, I mean, everybody has to be open, has to be seeking, and the Holy Spirit has to work there. And all you can do is share. That's all you can do. Leave it to the hands of God. Yeah. Um, anyway, Julie's good comment about, yeah, a friend in Iraq came to faith through visions. He lives there now, was baptized. See, that can happen in those countries. Yeah, those Muslim countries. So, um, yep, absolutely. Anybody else have any other thoughts or comments? Ian, could you say we are saved, depending not on our works, but the direction we are pointed in that direction can change in a moment? Ian, can you clarify that? Because I know you're on here. Just go ahead and talk. Yeah, I, Sorry. Was, thinking, I was thinking of things like the thief on the cross. He was yeah. not saved one moment, and, after, right. and at another moment he put his trust in Jesus. So right. he might have been seeking before then. And then yeah. he, but he's seeking, but he's still not yet pointed in the right direction. Then he, then he turned to Jesus and asked him, and at that moment his direction changed. And without doing anything whatsoever after that, oh, he was saved. Yeah, right. There's nothing to really, you wouldn't be able to examine his life in any detail. He just believed at that moment that was it. Then he died. So yeah, yeah that, no that can happen. Yeah, but... He had no you know, works to show for it either, you know? No, yeah, then that's, and that can happen. I mean, some people, you know, some people that could happen at the last minute or something or later in life or something, I don't know. And then they don't, they, as far as the judge, you know, the, the what we call the Bema Sea, we're judged, you know, by rewards and things like that. There wouldn't be much to show there, right? But he's still right with God through, you know, he's made a profession of faith in Jesus. So yeah, that's, that's an example of that where that's a rare case that happens but i'm sure it could happen yeah absolutely maybe he was seeking for a while i don't know we don't enough about him just don't know god knows where to meet people where they're at he knows who's seeking trust me he is not not ignorant so i remember i was seeking i was seeking the truth when i was living in california in college and i was living with two roommates and they were both jewish and i was just this protestant kid that didn't know much i was a nominal a best believer i just knew some things about jesus but i don't know i had kind of a weird i had a funny dream one night about it, something about jesus and i woke up and told them the next day they looked at me like i was nuts and uh and then i didn't talk to anybody about this for three or four years and then i came, wandered to a congregation three or four years later and i heard the gospel and became a believer 
So, you know, it just, God can plant little things in you, you know, over time and causes you to go in a certain direction, right? Yeah. I so, was reading Morrison's book on who moved the stone. And at yeah. the end of it, I thought, good grief. Yeah. This, guy actually, this guy actually rose from the dead. I've got a yep. decision to make. <laughs> right. right. Yep. That's a great book. Yep. 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 So just depends. I don't know. On the person. I run into people who are hardened as could be, and I run into people who are definitely open. It's all across the board. So, anybody else? Any your comments or questions about anything? Is anybody being challenged with this one regularly? Or just every once in a while? I'll tell you, you guys, you guys know who Bernie Sanders, or, yeah, Bernie Sanders is. One time he was interviewing a guy for, it's on video. I could have posted the link here, I forgot, but he was interviewing somebody for a position in Congress or something, and he's dirty. Bernie Sanders is Jewish, of course, and uh, he said to the guy, he said, is it true that you believe that people are, uh, he said, you believe people are condemned if they don't believe in Jesus? Is that right, that you have to believe in Jesus? And the guy said, well, that's my belief. I'm a Christian, and I mean, Jesus is the way to God, and you have to believe in and Jeopardy Sanders looked at the, the congressional hearing the other round. He said, that man is not qualified for this position. <laughs> That's what he said. And uh, over that issue, you know, in a, con in a congressional hearing, how about that? So talking about Jesus is the only way of salvation in a congressional hearing. Okay. Um, let's see here. Someone has a comment here. Let's see here. I got... Uh, Diana says, what might happen to false teachers? Can they be saved? Um, I don't know. Um, when you say a false teacher, if someone's just ignorant, they're teaching something that's false out of ignorance, like they literally just are uneducated about something, or maybe they just misinterpret something, or they're not doing it deliberately to be deceiving. You know what I mean? Like, I maybe, I, maybe let's say I'm teaching, I just don't know something like, wow, I didn't know that someone said he's a false teacher well maybe i just need to someone to sit me down and help me i just didn't know um i could still be a true believer i think and maybe just be misled right um but then if you get into people that are willfully deceiving people like over and over and they know it that gets a little more dicey i think as far as like i don't know about them <laughs> um because you know if they have the holy spirit in them i think he's going to convict them that there there's something wrong there um they should be knowing that something's not right and they should be trying to seek out what they're teaching is not right hopefully if they're teachable um okay someone mentioned here you mentioned proof of reincarnation my mother believes she was reincarnated because she has visions and a like for certain architecture related to a certain period of time she has visions of her having servants because of this there are other things in the bible she won't accept how do you defeat that biblically um well there's no evidence in the Bible for anything like there's no evidence for reincarnation in the Bible. There's only evidence for resurrection, right? We die once and then we face the judgment. Then we're resurrected later. And if Jesus rose from the dead, if there's evidence for that, and he speaks authoritatively, I'm going to listen to a guy that rose from the dead over anybody that thinks that they've been reincarnated. Nothing to take away respect for your mom, but I think that Jesus, obviously, if he rose from the dead, he speaks with a higher authority over any kind of you know, re reincarnation experience. Um, but the Bible doesn't directly address reincarnation, only extend it believes in resurrection. Um, but, you know, personal experiences like dreams, visions, things like that are really tricky. Um, they may be very real to people in some way, but they have to be tested by scripture, right? You test your experience in light of scripture, not the other way around. Um, and so I, um, you know, I, I think that that's uh, not something that I would hold a lot of weight to, like as authoritative, just because you have, a, I mean, I run to people out in the streets sometimes on campus, so I have a new revelation and God told me this, this, and this, and, you know, that, that isn't something I'm going to accept, obviously, because if they tell me something completely flatly contradicts the Bible, then obviously they didn't hear from God at all. That's their flesh or it's Satan deceiving them. I don't know right so yeah i i think i think experiences are have to be weighed against scripture and 
scripture does not teach any kind of reincarnation. So whatever it is, whether this experience is some sort of psychological thing or whether it's something deceptive, I don't know. Um, but I don't wouldn't have put a lot of weight on it. Like it's authoritative. She may put a lot of weight on it, but that's not, you know, we believe scripture has to be weighed in a lot of scripture, right? I would think, at least that's what I believe. What made your flaw the re reincarnation belief? Look, where to go? Missed that. One major flaw in, of the reincarnation belief is who or what decides who is reincarnated. Exactly, I agree. It would have to be intelligent mind of God, but then a moral code would be necessary in that. And this is in the Bible, which does not support more than one life. Very good. I agree 100%. Um, you just don't have any way to give any evidence that someone's been reincarnated. Like you said, that someone did something wrong and then it's being played out in the next life because of karma, right? And so what's the where's the moral standard come from to judge that person is that from their own belief or is that from the bible or what um but yeah the bible does not say anybody lives on on and on and on and on it just doesn't say that we die once that's it then we're resurrected later um good point i would agree okay maybe we should do something on reincarnation sometime anyway Reincarnation is kind of, it's kind of uh, popular today, right? It's cool. It's cool. I run into several people believe in it. Like, I believe in reincarnation. I'm like, really, what's your evidence for it? I just know it's true. I'm like, well, how do you know? Well, it's, I think people just, what they do now, it's karma. It's like, what do you do now? It'll come back to bite you later and you pay for it later. And I mean, it is true that some things we do in this life, like if you do something that, you know, you face the consequences, obviously there's consequences for our actions, but um, to say that you're facing the consequences of what happened in a past life is, I don't, how does that work? I mean, it's like, I, if something, I'm having something bad happen, I say, well, something happened, must have happened in your past life. This is why this is happening now. I, I just, that, that's nice. It's, it's speculation really. Right. So anyway. Anybody else have any other comments or thoughts? Good questions, good good comments. Does this mean that if, um, since I play tennis, I'm a really good tennis player in this life, does this mean the past life, I was like um, really good tennis player then, it's like carrying on in this life, is that what it is, is that how it works? So, or if I'm really bad, that means I was a really bad tennis player. Anyway, bad analogy, anyway, Tom gets it. Anyway, but because uh, he plays tennis too. No, but seriously, like Hitler's living a bad life. If Hitler did what he did and then he would be, he'd have to go through several reincarnations until he get, fixes that. See, until he fixes what he did. But who judges, who's judging him and who's sending him, who decides that? Is it God? Is it the God of the Bible? Is it, is it Krishna? Is it the Hindu God? Is it, is it uh, you know, it, it just, there's not, there's just not a lot of ways you can know that. Any kind of, I mean, resurrection, it's pretty concrete and good evidence that Jesus really rose from the dead. It's a one-time thing. So it's much sort of stronger than reincarnation. Anyway, if you come back as a slug, how would you work your way back up? Very good, Julie. I agree. So what about the ants that I stepped on in my bathroom last night? What if people came back as those? I threw them in the toilet after I stepped on them, and they're in a tissue in my toilet. I flushed it. So they have to go back, come back as something else now. So what do they come back now as? I don't know. They try again as another ant? I don't know. It feels like it's not fair, though. If you get reincarnated as a bug and you get stepped on, I mean, you didn't even have a chance there. Anyway. I don't know. But what about a bird? It's flying through the air, and then it, it comes in front of your car by accident. You hit it or your windshield. I don't know. You smash it. I don't know. By accident. Who knows? Anyway, anybody else have any other comments or thoughts? Uh, how about the sin, uh, Down syndrome people? Like, uh, how about the scriptures say about them? Um... Well, I said that, I said, I think people are handicapped. Yeah. I said that people don't, aren't able to access the gospel. I think God will be fair with them. Yeah. I don't think he's like, oh, darn, you're, you're Down syndrome and I'm just going to judge you because I just, I'm just going to do it because I'm a mean, angry God. No, he knows he's fair, right? He's, 
I don't think I'm worried that God knows how much that person's able to comprehend and know, right? Exactly. So that wouldn't be very good of God if he would do that, right? Um, let me mention one last thing here before we uh, wrap up and all. Um, something I just thought of. Just remember that when I talked about this, the um, uh, when you're, you're talking to people, you know, this is really important here, that slide I had up that number six and seven, um, you know, if someone doesn't accept the New Testament documents as authoritative and you're trying to proclaim Jesus as the only way to God, it's going to be really hard. I mean, you know, when you make that claim because you're relying on the New Testament documents, right? So, because that's the only place you find it. So you're going to have to give good reasons why the New Testament is, a, is authoritative, why it's historically reliable, right? If they care. And you can do that. There's good, there's ways you can do that. I've talked about that in other calls here. But just remember that that's very important. So just want to make sure that, um, um, make sure I mentioned that. As I emphasized before, anybody else, any other questions or anything, comments? Anybody? Was anybody struggling whether Jesus is the only way today? When you woke up, I'm not sure he's the only way to have a relationship with God. I'm not sure if he's the only savior, right? Anybody? No, you're not. Anyway, but yeah, it's good. That, that, that objection is going to be around for a while. You're just going to have to deal with it. And there's definitely a lot of people who believe a lot of different things in our country, as you've noticed. There's a lot of Muslims, a lot of Hindus, a lot of Jewish people, just people who believe different things. So you're just going to have to have some, uh, some reasons why you think that, right? But I would say if you can challenge someone on this, this is where I left, I'll leave it with, with, with you this. So I was talking to a Hindu girl yesterday, is devoutly Hindu. I mean, she was pretty devout Hindu. She had, to, she was, she struggled with that being struck in a, stuck in a caste system. Then I was talking to an atheist at the same time they were friends. And uh, I basically, the last question I asked them, wouldn't you agree if Jesus really rose from the dead that changes the whole ball game? I mean, Jesus really rose from the dead. The God, of the Bible is the one true God. You can know there's an afterlife. You can know who really God is because he came in the person of Jesus and everything. And that just changes the whole ballgame. Would you just agree with me? Even if you don't agree, it's true. And uh, yeah, that changes everything. I'm like, well, so that's where we want to start next time we have our conversation. So that's something you always want to say to someone is that the resurrection changes the whole ball game. And um, now, I mean, a Muslim would say, well, I don't believe he ever died anyway. You know, so he didn't rise from the dead because of course he never died. And that brings up the issue of the Quran again. But the point is, you, that's a good question to ask people if he rose from the dead. And why he rose from the dead is important, you know, to give us life with God. We're dead in our sins. We need to be made alive, right? It isn't just like a cool thing to believe in. It it's, makes us alive to God. That's what Jesus did by rising from the dead. We're dead to God. Now we're alive to God. That's kind of something people need to understand. Anybody else? And otherwise, I'll just pray us out. I, I'll send out the video and the... Uh, the PowerPoint, everyone's on the email list. If you're not on the PowerPoint or email list, I'll write down my email here. Make sure you write this down so you can be added if you're new here to these calls. That's my email. You can be added. I can send you the clip. I record all these and uh, I send out the, uh, the PowerPoint as well. So you're welcome to uh, email me there if you're not on the email list. Other than that, I don't have much else to add. Anybody else? Otherwise, I'll pray us out. One going once, going twice. Anybody? Nobody. Okay, so I'll ask one question. Last question. Okay. Okay, so uh, one time, basically, like you mentioned about Hindu girls, so that reminded me. I shared a gospel with some Hindu person, and then I explained that why to accept. Uh, Christianity and uh, about Jesus, everything. And at the end, that person asked me the question, basically, that they said that, what is this then, what they are doing in Hinduism? So what is this then? So what is what would be the answer for that? What You said, what are they doing in Hinduism? Like that person asked me, yes, exactly. That, that what, uh, like basically they also believe that whatever they are doing is correct, right? So they feel that that's whatever they are doing, that's right, they are doing, that is also correct, they are doing. So basically that person was concerned about that, then what they are doing is like, what about Hinduism they are doing? So how about that they are worshiping idol and also kind of uh, that, what about that? So about them just worship, you mean like believing what they believe in Hinduism and exactly. just practicing it? Exactly. Like, 
like what are we concerned about it? is that what you're asking is that yeah yeah basically like uh, when i explained about christianity so the person said that when you say that that the christianity is the truth so what about hinduism then what they are doing in hinduism then what is that they are doing what about that well they're they're worshiping i mean there's every 330 million gods exactly. and i mean they don't yeah. and it, it also contradicts the universe because hinduism believes that the universe is eternal it's always existed and in we know that in basic i mean in cosmology now and you don't even need the bible to prove this that the universe had a beginning now so it hasn't always existed and so you know in hinduism the, the universe has just always existed it's always been there it never had a beginning point that's that contradicts what we know about modern cosmology um so their view of the universe doesn't make doesn't make any sense i think evil is also an illusion to them yeah. um evil is not an illusion at all it's a camping illusion and uh obviously it's just a lot more simpler to, to believe one god over 330 million gods i mean it's just one god's a lot makes more sense practically yeah. than trying to figure out 330 million gods and read there's no evidence for reincarnation yeah so you know there's just problems all around with it just several problems you know all yeah I don't, I mean, that's, I mean, there's problems with the major structure of the belief system, I think. Yeah. And yeah. the main problem, it's, I think, quite obvious that because they are worshiping idols and God is against that and God says Well, that. yeah, I mean, if you're worshiping multiple gods, yeah, that's, yeah. that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they come to faith too, like, they can come to faith like everybody else does, it's happened. Exactly. But anyway. Yeah. That's right. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, well, good question. Um. All right, well, I'll go ahead and pray us out and I'll send this information out and everybody, I thank you for a good uh, time. And, um, you know, I hope that uh, you got something out of it and I will send out the uh, the clip once it's recorded in the PowerPoint and uh, we'll go from there. But uh, thanks for joining tonight. Everybody have a great week. Enjoy every day of your life. It's a gift and um, stay close to the Lord. Lord, we just thank, I'll just pray. Lord, uh, thank you for this time. Uh, we thank you, God, that you provided a way for us to be delivered from you know, our own sins and to come into a new way of life with you, delivered from something, but brought into a new relationship with you, a new way of living. Lord, I pray for each person here tonight that they would stay close to you. I pray, God, that we'd remember every day as a new day with you, that we can be renewed in our relationship with you. And I pray, God, everybody would not take you for granted. I pray, God, every day that we'd remember that you're with us, so you know all our pressing needs. I pray for all those pressing needs to be met for each person here tonight. And I pray, Lord God, you just bless uh, each person here with peace. And I pray, God, we'd have a good week, the rest of the week. And uh, thank you, God, for what you've done through the Messiah. We pray this in his name. Amen. All right, all. Thank you so much. And I will see you next week, okay? Amen. God bless you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Email. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Email me if you need anything. Take care.